Welcome to day 77 of the COP. Uh, my name is Randy Bell. I'm an associate partner at Denton's Global Advisors and I'm working with the Net Zero Nuclear Initiative. It's really great uh, to have you all here today for a conversation called Innovate for Nuclear, Forging Tomorrow's Nuclear Path. And um, this conversation is going to be um, based on a workshop that uh, we held on the sidelines of the Net Zero Nuclear Summit um, over the past two days. Uh, so we're going to get a readout of that workshop on what we need, uh, how, what, what types of innovation we need, and how we realize our tripling nuclear goals. So the, our two speakers today are um, Abu Bakr Sadiq Aliou, uh, Nuclear Research Officer from the Center for Renewable Energy and Sustainable, Sustainability Transitions, um, and Emma Wong, who's a Senior Nuclear Technology and Innovation Advisor at the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency. And Emma was the driving force behind uh, behind this workshop. So what we're going to do, we're going to turn it over first to Emma to give a readout of the workshop and then we'll have a conversation. So Emma, there you go. Yeah, we're sharing iPads today. Um, but I, I will say, Randy, thank you for letting me host the workshop and all of the roadblocks you threw at me because that's what innovation is really about <laughs> is how do you pivot at the last minute with everything you threw at me? And I think and it was- And succeed. And succeed. Yep. But the thing is, you can't be a fail afraid of failure either, because like, that's also part of innovation. But um, I'm going to really give now kind of where I came up with these ideas, um, why I wanted to put this on, and then a little recap of what came out of the workshop. And then, of course, we'll hear from a real participant who was there. You can tell me the honest truth on whether you liked it or not. Um, and I have no idea what he'll say, so it'll be perfect. So when you really think about the future, is, it, do you see what you see now? Do you see something different? Do you see us with flying cars? Do you see us with drones everywhere? I mean, it could be anything you want. It really is usually very uh, abstract, depending on who you talk to. So when you think about something that may be really that far off um, and our aspirational future of what our world can be like, uh, what our industry can be like, especially the nuclear industry and the energy industry, what does it really look like? It really is important to think about what is the end goal we have in mind? What is that problem we would want to solve? And I really think right now um, we want to have clean, sustainable, and equitable energy system that meets our society's needs. It's a really easy goal to go for, um, but when you think about it, is it really that easy? I don't think so. So here at COP28, we've already heard the call and commitment to triple the nuclear energy to reach net zero. But the big question I have for everyone, including everyone here, is how are we gonna do that? That is the big question everyone's asking. How are we really going to triple nuclear energy to meet this goal? It's great we all can say these words, but like I wanna know how. And so that was kind of, well, I mean, I, I created my workshop before they, they did this announcement. I had no idea. But when I, even when I was just thinking about decarbonization and, you know, we want to get to net zero eventually, um, we have to think differently. We have to change people's minds. And what does that come down to? It's, it's innovation, innovation culture. And that's something I've been talking about and thinking about for many years past. And so that's really something I wanted to bring to COP. And so Randy here was kind enough to let me, and had faith actually on what this workshop I was gonna hold would be. He had no idea. I gave him a briefing. He said, this sounds great. It's gonna be interactive. It will be different. And I, and I really applaud for you um, just saying yes to something that sounded really probably crazy to you. It um, crazy. Ah, okay. You're being nice. So two days ago, um, I held a workshop. It was based on actually a 2022 Global Forum for Nuclear Innovation workshop I had actually held in London. Um, that workshop was mainly focused on innovation culture. Uh, in previous editions of this Global Forum, we had talked about technologies. What are the technologies can we use to accelerate uh, to meet these sustainability goals? But then it came down to, well, we have the technology. How do we implement? How do we drive people to think differently? And how do we create these teams to actually do these innovations that we want? It came down to innovation culture. We talked to so many experts, so many people around the world, and that's really what it came down to. 
I held these um, four different little workshops and they were highly impactful. I never actually imagined, I was ready to fail. I was like, okay, if anything, people would have fun, people would network, you know, they would have coffee, it would be great. But the impact I saw coming out of London really said to me, I need to bring this on a bigger stage. The, that, that group was only about like 150 people. How far can you get with 150? So I was like, Randy had this, uh, this group of young folks who I was like, these are the people of the future. These are the people who need to hear about these different ways of thinking to, to move a, an idea forward. Um, so the Global Forum for Nuclear Innovation was, is led by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the OECD Nuclear Energy Agency, where I'm from right now, the UK National uh, Nuclear Laboratory, uh, and then EPRI, uh, who is also here, and I also um, work for as well. And they always have a local host utility. So it's really important to have the end user also be there when you have these conversations. And so I had four workshops in London. Well, due to time constraints, we could only hold two of them. So you only got a taste of what we were able to give in London, and I'm actually gonna give you all four. Um, and, and he'll actually get to talk about why later. And so I, the two uh, interactive activities that I held here at this workshop two days ago were first, the first one is named The Challenge, which challenges you to challenge your own thinking in every single way. Like I threw out so many different things for the participants to look at and you actually probably didn't even know all the ways I challenged you, not yet anyway. And then the second was to look at lateral thinking using um, what we call uh, the de bono thinking hats. So it's just different ways of thinking about different problems. And so we'll probably dive more into that. And we gave them a simple problem to think about. It's really just easy as, how do you decarbonize your commute to work? But when you think about that, if you have a global audience, everyone has a different place that they're going to work. They have different environmental conditions. So how do you have that conversation? And now we have even more global teams. We need to partner with each other and work together. So I thought it would be a really e good exercise to just have conversations about something you think is simple, but is not. And then, um, of course, uh, uh, where are my conclusions? Oh, here are my conclusions, sorry. It's formatted differently than when I gave them to Randy. It's OK. And so. The conclusions out of this workshop, uh, and I put three of them here, and, and there are so many more, and you can help me with some of the conclusions you had as well, is that in order to meet our decarbonization goals, we really need to challenge our way of thinking. Everything from our assumptions on what we actually think our goals are, because maybe those aren't the real goals. We say them, but are those the real goals we're asking for? Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, I, I even learned this from the participants, is that when you fail, and there was an instance where um, one of the groups had failed, you pivot right away and you make it work. And I saw this in real time and it really inspired me that you know these participants, our future, the youth, and the, the young people, I mean, they're able to think on their toes and actually solve problems in real time. Uh, also, another conclusion is um, diversity in thinking will bring you even more rich conclusions. Uh, also, being able to think in different ways, you can spur new ideas, see other points of view. I saw this in real time as, as the workshop was commencing, and see problems in a different way and other modes of thinking. Uh, I actually saw in your decarbonize your way to work, people thought about bicycles. They thought about like, you know, maybe walking and things like that. But then someone asked about, well, why don't we just redesign the cities instead? Let's look at it from a different perspective. And I was like, I hadn't even thought of that. So if that's what it brings is a really new perspective, I was already inspired myself. And lastly, the actions to make change and the action in of the energy sector um, are going to take innovation and innovation culture to really meet these goals and change the way we think in order to actually meet the tripling of nuclear because that extreme commitment is going to take extreme thinking. Thank you. Uh, it sounds like it was uh, quite an experience um, and that you guys learned a whole lot. Um, 
uh, I'd love to hear from Abu Bakr your take on, on the experience, um, what you learned and what you're going to bring back home. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, like you said, my name is Abu Bakr Sadiq Ali from the Center for Renewable Energy and Sustainability Transitions by University Kanu from Nigeria. Actually, I went to the summit uh, without having the workshop in mind. I was sitting down <laughs> listening to one of the sessions and I was called upon that uh, we have a workshop going on somewhere. Well, I joined the team and I was lucky because when we came, we were like uh, about 30 of us and then uh, only 24 had seats. I was lucky to have a seat and uh, this was workshop started. Uh, one of the major things that, uh, that tend to uh, excite me was uh, the first session. Uh, the kids were given and I think what we were asked to do was uh, to a kind of uh, design or produce uh, a vehicle that could uh, move using wind energy and the kit contains uh, some uh, so many things uh, with some some things like wheels you know toothpicks and what have you uh, the first time when I looked them I started thinking of how to construct a you know a little vehicle a car or something like that and then all of a sudden one of the teammates said no uh, the instruction says just a means of transportation from one end to another using wind no description of what you are expected to do. Uh, at the first instant, I was like, no. But then it clicked to me too and uh, the other team members. And uh, fortunately, we just rolled a paper in form of a cylindrical shape and then sort of tape it. And then we just sat down and said, let's pretend we are doing something. And then all the teams were busy designing cars, you know. Then after the session, uh, we were asked to present our results and then our team won because uh, the cylindrical uh, shape was just put on the table and then you just blow it, uh, give it that wind uh, energy and then it moves in just I think 15 seconds. For others, they have uh, already, because uh, some of them were engineers and what have you, they've already designed mini cars, uh, you know, but then some of them were not working and some of them were working, were working slowly things like that so one of the most important message I took there was uh, problems sometimes don't have complex solutions you don't have to think very far for you to get your solution sometimes your solutions are right there before you so you don't have to crack your brain all the times another to solve uh, problems and another thing is uh, compatibility in terms of uh, innovation uh, your, 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 innov your innovation had to be incompatible to the end user. You don't have to be, uh, you, you should make it simple in such a way that your end users uh, uh, can relate with it. This was uh, the first session. And then the second session has to do with uh, how we think. Uh, we were asked to, like she said, we were asked to propose a solution on how to decarbonize uh, uh, how to commit from uh, for when going to work. So uh, I think we are we were six, and there was uh, the person in charge who is responsible for thinking uh, of all what the others think to come up with the solution. We have the positive thinker, we have the negative thinker, we have the creative one, and then the last one feelings exactly. So. I was unlucky to be given the one thinking about the thinking of others and then meant, um, monitoring and then planning. Uh, I'm not a good planner. Uh, yeah. So everyone said his uh, opinions and then we came up with the solution. Uh, up to the time we finished, I was not able to think on what others have said and come up with a solution when the time ended. We, 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 we parted without coming up with anything. It was when I sat down uh, and presentations were started to be taken. That was when I was able to process and then come up uh, with the solution using the inputs given by the team members. So uh, it made me feel okay. Uh, so this is how people feel when you interact with them. When, because I was in other, someone's shoes and I felt the way they feel when we are communicating. So that gave me a sense of uh, giving excuses to people uh, when we are probably coming up with a solution or in a meeting. 
I think uh, the session altogether were interesting, and I really enjoyed them. So thank you so much. That's that's really interesting, and I I love the description of these activities. Now let's expand this out. So we're here talking about tripling nuclear capacity by 2050, which is a, an achievable goal, but there will need to be a lot done between now and 2050, and we've got to get started right away. So how how have do these activities um, impact how you think about um, how we reach those goals, how we, what the sort of the mechanisms for accomplishing our tripling goals are. So uh, how, what the how? So how do you do this? Well, that's the billion trillion dollar question, Randy. Yes, it is. I'm not sure we're gonna we'll solve it here, but when I think about needing to triple the nuclear capacity, first off is the long term operation and the continuing operation of our current fleet. And to do that, they have to be economical. They have to be, of course, they have to be safe. And we will need other innovative solutions probably to keep them that way. Um, it may be automation. It may be digitalization. Um, but a lot of times you're, you have to challenge yourself in thinking, is that really what we need to keep them economical? Is there an easier, cheaper way of thinking about it? before you move on to that. So that's one thing we'll have to do. But second one is we have you know, this new fleet that is probably coming. It, it could be a new fleet of large reactors. It also could be a new fleet of um, small modular reactors or even advanced reactors, generation four. We're gonna have to think really innovatively, how are we going to put these on the grid? Where should they go? What is their ultimate use case? Um, they can be used to decarbonize hard to abate sectors, but that will take engineering and other innovations to do that. Or it may take a different process and another way of thinking to make that happen. Um, I was moderating a panel yesterday and it, it, the, one of the conclusions was we have to change the way we think and challenge everything we know and to really find the solution to get to triple to nuclear whether it be in supply chain, finance, or any other way. And so you think that the, the workshop was really helping you to challenge how you think, right? That's, yes. is that, was that the goal? That was the goal. Yep. So, Abu Bakr, how, do you, how did it change when you're, when you're thinking about tripling nuclear, advocating for nuclear uh, back in Nigeria? How, how did the workshop impact how you think about that advocacy and about, about how to really d deliver? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, like... Uh, she said it's the question of innovation and uh, to me innovation in uh, the nuclear industry at the moment is not just important but uh, I think it's a necessity uh, for looking at the global uh, energy demography I think there are three things you look at uh, for the choice of energy first of all is the energy security uh, affordability and then um, uh, affordability and then environmental protection so looking at these three things I think the nuclear industry will need to come out of its, uh, uh, of its old shell in order to welcome uh, I innovation because uh, we are talking of tripling the energy, nuclear energy by 2050 and then we should not forget that other industries like renewables are also under uh, trying to do that. Now to, ab to be able to stand out we need to do this because we need uh, flexibility. Uh, in terms of generation, we need a uh, uh, decrease in, in cost and then uh, some kind of policies uh, which are somehow stiffening, especially for uh, uh, upcoming embarking countries. So really, uh, the, the nuclear industry need to embrace uh, innovation. And uh, I believe when we do that, we will be able to uh, reach our goal. So you mentioned um, other energy types that, uh, that are also trying to triple that we need renewables etc so it's actually one of the questions that I have is how do you think about innovation when it comes to nuclear interacting with other energies that are also being developed that we're gonna need um, we're obviously gonna need as, as much clean power as we can get and different geographies and different uh, uh, different weathers uh, weather weather patterns etc mean that different countries will have different needs. 
What do you think about in terms of nuclear working with these other, uh, other energy sources to really make sure that we reach our goals, which is net zero? Um, how, how is that innovation piece necessary? Well, I'm going to say this is, this is pretty easy. The answer is we need to work with all the other energy sources. Like, we have a toolbox of all of these different energy sources. We also have energy storage coming up. We have all of these things. Why would we not use them all? We have all the common goal here to combat climate change, to go to decarbonization, to get to net zero. There is not one answer. There should be so many different answers and so many different permutations that nuclear really does need to talk to and work with the other industries. I was fortunate um, earlier this year to uh, be on a panel that was nuclear and geothermal together. It was one of the most fascinating panels I had been on and very inspirational. As I was prepping for this panel, we had, you know, we always have these pre-meetings and things. And I was talking to them and I'm like, they were like, these are the problems we have in geothermal. I'm like, but I know some of these answers. I can help you with this. Let me help you move forward in your journey. And then maybe you have some of the answers for me as well. Because we're like, for me, like no one is going to be able to solve all the problems by themselves. And so I actually had been able to create relationships with the geothermal community. And I've been able to appreciate some of the things and um, in working with the Electric Power Research Institute, who does all of them, they're able to communicate and actually do joint uh, research projects that can help all, all of these different modes of uh, energy uh, generation. I was ironically on a panel this spring about fusion and geothermal. Mm. Uh, and I was in Iceland, where they have no need for anything but geothermal, because they have all the geothermal in the world but they still wanted to learn. And there was a really interesting conversation. It's about policy, but there was a really interesting conversation about policies that were supportive of all types of different energy. So um, I'd love, since you, you were the first one to mention renewables, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think uh, the question of uh, working together, I think, first of all, we should understand that uh, we are decarbonizing, decarbonizing for a reason. And the reason is we want to meet uh, net zero. And that is not a personal, uh, goal for individual uh, energy sectors. It is a collective goal in order to save the planet. So it means we have to work together because the goal is for all of us. Uh, my, in, 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 in my center, uh, we've been able to create a, an environment where uh, different uh, thematics are working together. In my center, we have the solar unit, we have the nuclear unit, and we have the biofuels. All of us working together in the same center trying to pursue uh, energy transition for the nation and uh, West Africa as well. So it means we need to get come together in terms of research and development because no matter how different we are, we have intersections. Since we are all in the nuclear industry, we have intersections and we can come together on those intersections to see how we can uh, make those things better. And then uh, even when we go back to our individual thematics, we can still ask for uh, help from other thematics, but till if they, they have those solutions for us. I think that's my take. Fantastic. So one of the things that um, Emma and I were talking about before this workshop was that when you say innovation, people often first think about technology innovation, but we really need innovation across the whole ecosystem. So technology, you need financial innovation, you need policy innovation, and I wonder if we might be able to just break down, to sort of rapid fire, the types of innovation that you'd like to see from, from the various sectors. So, like, let's start with technology, and then there's, like, startups who are developing a, a very specific technology, then there are incumbents who are developing new technology, so you sort of can break it down even there. So, maybe we can just do sort of rapid fire, what type of innovation... It, that do we need to see from each of these sectors? So let's start with the, the first thing we all come think about when we think about innovation, which is the startups. So what do, you, what do we think you need to see from the startups? I, I think the startups, they're always great because they're small, nimble, agile. They're the ones who are gonna get the answers even quicker because they just don't have red tape. They operate in chaos is what they like to do, but they're, it's like organized chaos. I don't know how it happens. But what I need to see from them is to actually have more conversations with what the problems they need to solve are. Mm -hmm. And I've actually had a call from a lot of utilities saying, we need to support startups more 
because they can get to those answers faster. But then, but we need to give them those problems that they can work on so they tailor what they're doing to actually answer problems we need done today. And then we can implement them a whole lot quicker. So that's one way of accelerating it and, and supporting that innovation that happens at startups. Yeah, for startups, I think they need to be more passionate and optimistic on what they are doing. And then there's one thing. Uh, there are other startups before them that have succeeded. They should try as much as possible to look into the mistakes of those uh, startup and then build on them so as uh, to not make the same mistakes. Okay, now what about the, the incumbents who are developing new technologies? Uh, that's harder, but it's, it's kind of like you need to have your own innovation ecosystem. You got to support that innovation culture. You can't be afraid of failure. That is the big thing. It's not failure, it's lessons learned on what not to do the next time. That's for the incumbents, is really embrace that and support it. Yeah, they should also be resilient because sometimes take uh, longer time than you think. Uh, it's quite disheartening when you set uh, a boundary probably your, your, your technology is going to be out maybe 2017 and then it's 2018 you're still working on it it's quite disheartening but they should be resilient and believe in what they are doing okay to the financial sector what kind of innovation do we need from the financial sector to accelerate nuclear i don't know the financial sector all of that well i mean there's always something to learn for us as well but i think there needs to be more communication um, and so it could be innovating themselves and thinking about how they process and communicate with the nuclear sector in order to actually learn what some of the risks might be. And so we can learn from them on how we can answer those questions. Yeah, to me, I think they need to look at the policies uh, that restrict some of these uh, uh, research industries from uh, accessing uh, those funds because they are those kind of policies. Uh, so some research, some financial institutions have uh, specific uh, researches where they put or invest in. So I think they should look at those uh, uh, policies and try as much as possible to lax them so that uh, specifically the, nu the nuclear industry can be able to access uh, funding and be able to move on with their researches. I'm going to take my moderator's privilege and editorialize for a minute and I'm going to say we need the financial sector. It sort of aligns with both what you said but I'm going to put it, try to put a sharper point on it. They need to show up. They need to be here at COP, at Net Zero Nuclear, some of them showed up, but there was a lot of conversations and a lot of interest. But in the end, they're still a little, little wary. And so the innovation really needs to come in terms of their attitude towards nuclear and the recognition that they are now behind the curve um, because policy has moved faster than they have moved. And when, when the government's moving faster than the financial sector, we know we've got a problem. Um, but now we'll pivot to the government. Um, so what do we need from governments and policy? I, I, well, I mean, that's a hard one because globally, governments and policy, um, they're different around the world. Yeah. They all have different needs, different wants. Um, coming from the Nuclear Energy Agency, though, we try to look at the commonality, looking at the gaps, and then write policy briefs uh, that policymakers can use. What we probably need more of is what are the gaps? What are the most important things that they need more support from, uh, from the policy angle? Uh, to try to do that acceleration. Um, sometimes it's not clear. Yeah, as a researcher, I think I will ask the policy makers to listen to the scientists. Uh, in most cases, they do uh, some of these policies without necessarily looking at uh, the impacts from the science uh, aspect. But I think they lead to listen to science. Let's talk specifically about in Nigeria and West Africa. What do we need to accelerate nuclear there? Because it's it's only beginning to be part of the conversation, the, the, global, the global nuclear conversation, is the, how to put nuclear in the global south and in particular in West Africa, where there was a conference in Ghana last month at the end of October. And th this is starting to happen, but how do we get that faster? Yeah, luckily enough, I was part of that conference, I attended, and I think uh, the major uh, issue with the West African countries in terms of deployment of uh, nuclear technology in the region is uh, political will. I think uh, they, are, they do, the political will is, is, as, is absent. As far back as 1960, I think Kwame Nkrumah took interest in nuclear technology and he was almost deploying a nuclear reactor in Ghana. That was 1960s. Wow. Now, 
what is stopping them from doing it in the 2020s? So I think the political way is important. And uh, another the other thing is also the political factor, both uh, internationally and locally. I think they pay more attention to politics a lot. I think uh, it's high time we remove politics out of the uh, nuclear industry. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Now, I want to see if the audience here has any questions. Um, we're always eager to engage. Oh, we do have one right up in the front. Let me be the mic runner now. Hey, I'm Will Smith with Epri. This is the third COP I've been a part of, and you have, you know, obviously you do have breakthroughs, but then you have these kumbaya moments. You have MOUs and things like that that aren't worth the paper they're written on. So whether you're thinking about nuclear innovation or you're thinking about, you know, things in the workshop or in the nuclear sector more broadly, how do you ingrain that innovative mindset and how do you make sure that there's lasting change and it's not just a couple of moments and then, you know, you go back into your daily life and you forget? Good question. I'll, I'll start. Thank you, Will. Um, I mean, that was the whole point of bringing this workshop to COP. Um, it's, it was meant... So part of the inspiration for this is that even though I, was, I taught some of these in London, I taught none of these activities here at that workshop. I actually, um, EPRI was so kind to put together what we call train the trainer modules. And we actually trained the two hosts. We actually had three, uh, but we didn't have time for the third module. Uh, but we, ha we trained two people who had never taught this, these, those modules before. They have never, they, we gave it to them a month before. It was kind of a little bit of an experiment, um, and nobody actually knew um, except for them. They had to learn it and deliver it, and it was flawless. You would probably have never known that they never had, they had just seen this material once before. And so, and that um, what we're going to do for all the participants is we're going to actually give them, and have, they have the ability to be trained themselves. So they've, they've taken it. Um, and I'm going to actually give you all four modules Thank out you. there. And um, I'm probably anyone else who wants it. You can just let me know. Um, and we'll put it out there. And you can be trained on them. And then you can deliver them yourself to really ingrain and the challenger mindset, the diversity in thinking using lateral thinking. We actually have one looking at role models. What do you want your role model to be? What do you want it to look like? Um, and so, and those are the three we were supposed to get. So, uh, but we, we didn't have time for that. And so that's one way of doing it. It's you train other people to be able to give them the tool sets in order to then keep that mindset moving. And so um, I'm going to try to keep doing this, keep doing uh, these workshops in different forums and, and really spread the word. But like, it's not just doing it once. You're training other people to do it, which then keeps that moving. And one inspirational thing, and I, I know you, you already have told me you're going to use them, but one of the other trainers who didn't get to give her module, she's like, I want to learn the other ones I need to give them as well. And so I have to give her all the other ones, and she's going to actually implement it um, at her Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I don't know if people know that um, what they're signing up for to go <laughs> to a Christmas party, but... Um, Christmas party slash innovation mindset Innovation training. mindset training. Cause, but I don't know if she'll, she's going to tell them that's what it is that they're doing. It's just going to be in just a fun, games. it's just a party game about lateral thinking. <laughs> so, but that's one way of doing and, and ingraining that mindset mm -hmm. into it. But the last thing I'll say uh, before I hand it over is that um, the Global Forum for Nuclear Innovation will be happening again in Miami in 2024, Ooh. where we're really taking this, we've, we've now done the innovation culture. We have that ambition. We have the people wanting to work on it. But now it's really, how do we turn that into action? How do we turn that into bite-sized pieces that the industry and all of these smart people can go do together? And so that will be happening in Miami, um, and I'm really excited. When? Oh, that's a big question. It's the last week of it. Um, or we can, if we can get Katie to come up here, who is wearing the shirt, because I can never remember the dates. Oh, there we go. June 24th through 27th, 2024. Yep, in Miami. So it... It is truly global because it is moving around the world. The first one was in Korea, then we went to London, now we're going to the US. Um, I have sites on 2025, but I can't reveal that. Fantastic. Abhak, do you want to? Yeah, I think for me, 
The question of tripling uh, uh, energy by 2050, it's, it's enormous. Because uh, when I heard about the declaration, I was like, I was happy in a way, but then I was, uh, you know, uh, because I think with the way we are thinking now uh, in, the, in, the, in the industry, I don't think we will be able to make it. So if we are really serious about it, we need to overhaul our thinking faculty in order to achieve uh, uh, that. And some of the ways we are going to do that is this, some of this kind of workshops and trainings. Great. We've got another question in the back. Hi, um, my name is Jimmy Xu. I'm a professor of law from Taiwan Academia Seneca. Um, I want to ask you about um, um, the more more of the political aspect um, of your work. So um, I'm speaking from you know from a Taiwanese perspective because it is still a very very politically controversial issue in Taiwan whether to continue to uh, to use nuclear power and i think one of the aspect is that you know there was there was a very vibrant uh, anti nuke uh, social movement uh, in the 90s in the west i wonder if that is still so you know after all these years because um, from my perspective, I think Taiwan is still, uh, the current governing ideology was forged uh, during the 90s in the association, you know, the social movement and the opposition movement uh, in democratic transition was associated with the anti-nuke movement in the West. So I'm wonder, wondering whether in your work, um, the, the, the political pressure or political uh, resistance comes from, you know, still, still comes a lot from, from the civil society uh, aspect. So it's a really great question and something that we've been talking a lot about at Nitzer Nuclear um, all week. Um, we've been here since the second was our first event. Um, uh, but, I'll let, but I'll let you guys answer because you're, you're really in the thick of it. Oh, from an uh, international organization, I'm working at the Nuclear Energy Agency. Yes, we, I mean, we look at what the communities say from pro to anti, right? We have to look at that as a whole when we are thinking about anything that we're going to do. Um, we are non-biased as an agency, so what we publish, are, I would like to hope, is unbiased truth. So it c should be telling you information that anyone can use, a policymaker, a, a lawmaker, a citizen, um, and it should just be giving you straight information. But we do have to keep that mindset in mind that anyone will be reading this and it needs to be able to be used by any of those people. Uh, so, yes, we do get comments sometimes from, you know, the anti-nuclear society. We also get comments from the pro-nuclear society. But what I like to think is when you get these comments from both sides, that can actually make whatever you're producing better. Because if you can write something that they both can use and it's the truth, then hopefully it's imparting some knowledge to them that, maybe they're, they can change the way that they're thinking about something with the information you're giving them. So from an, an unbiased point of view, like I wanna hear all of these different views in order to make whatever I'm saying better and hopefully more informative to those people who have, have questions. But I will also like to say, as I'm learning more about all the countries and how they're going out there, a lot of what you're seeing in the change of views is a lot of communication, education, mm -hmm and just putting information out there and allowing the communities at large to ask questions. Just making people available to ask questions about what they fear the most. Is it like what the Simpsons put on TV? Is it really gonna have three eyes on a, on a fish head? Is there really green goo coming out? No, that doesn't really exist. We, we know this as nuclear professionals, but this is what's put out in the media. So to answer those questions truthfully from someone who they can trust is really one of the biggest ways to start just educating and giving them information, like real information they can use. Yeah, I think uh, this question, uh, for me, you cannot make everyone pro-nuclear and you cannot make everyone anti-nuclear. But then uh, it's obvious uh, these days that uh, the nuclear advocacy uh, aspect of the nuclear industry has done a lot. Uh, we, we've seen uh, uh, works by civil societies include uh, young people and to me it seems the perception has changed. I see it as uh, we've even uh, reached where we were not expecting to reach. 
two years back, you don't expect 22 countries, including the U.S., to ratify a declaration to triple energy, uh, nuclear energy by 2050. It won't happen in COP, but now we are seeing it. And to me, most of the times, uh, the, the decision of the leaders uh, moves with the waves of, uh, of the thinking of the masses. Uh, that tells you that there's really a change in the perception. And we've carried so many uh, statistics in different places. Uh, places where it used to be pro, uh, uh, anti-nuclear have now declined. And then places where they used to be pro-nuclear, they have increased. I think that's... Yeah. It's so country and jurisdictionally specific. So um, Finland has less than 10% of the population is against nuclear, where, you know, basically right around the corner in Germany, um, they're, they're, they're still pretty anti-nuclear, though even that's changing. Um, the United States, of course, where, I, where I'm from, um, you're starting to see a, just a tremendous movement um, on the left to be pro-nuclear. And the left used to be anti-nuclear. And so, um, you know, the, the Biden administration proudly um, has taken on the nuclear policies of the nuclear energy policies of the Trump administration and expanded on them. There's, it's a seamless transition from Trump to Biden on nuclear um, and in a way that is, is really positive for the industry because everyone knows that um, not every, most people in the United States, most, most policymakers, Biden administration in particular, know that you need nuclear to meet net zero goals. So, um, but again, it's very, very jurisdictionally specific. But the education that is happening, um, and it's really being led by a, a new generation of, of influencers and, um, and activists, and there are a number, uh, I think Net Zero Nuclear um, had 50 or so attend. Um, uh, they're really helping spread the word and really changing the way in which um, people think about nuclear. Because now, um, particularly for younger generation, climate change is the biggest threat. And just looking at the numbers, climate change is a far bigger threat than nuclear energy could ever be. And so um, when, you're, when you're balancing risks, um, climate change is, is just the, the thing that we need to all be focused on. And so you're really seeing that come out. Um, and just one final thing is that in the United States, Miss America this year was a nuclear engineer and has been traveling the world advocating for nuclear power. So it's really, really remarkable to see, to yeah. see these types of changes. I was in a panel with her yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, she's fantastic. We've got another question right there. Oh, what, we've got one there, and then we'll come to you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rick. I'm a material scientist. My focus is on aviation, air cargo logistics, composite materials, so on and so forth. Uh, we are looking into a hydrogen-powered cargo aircraft. Also can use sustainable aviation fuels. One of the issues and barriers that we've identified is, okay, with SAF or sustainable aviation fuels, it's not net zero. And there's different blends of that. Hydrogen comments are, can you get the cost down? Mm -hmm. And is it going to be viable in 10 years or 15 years? Uh, cost, at least from what we're looking at, needs to be at or below $2.50, that's US dollars per gallon. That's the cost of Jet A fuel mm -hmm. right now. So you can take that data, it's publicly available. IRENA is one of the websites. What are your comments on hydrogen and generated using small modular reactors? Can anybody comment on SMRs? Yeah. If you wanna take it? I, I can take it, you can take it. We probably both can take it. Um, there's been a lot of work uh, at a lot of different institutions on hydrogen and looking at the cost of it. Um, there has been a lot of focus and seeing if, not just for SMRs, but large builds as well, if you can pair hydrogen generation with it. Um, right now, with a lot of other generation sources of in, uh, you know, electricity coming on, there and nuclear runs 24-7, right? So there's a lot of excess heat and electricity that may not need to be put on the grid at any given time and may be used to generate hydrogen. If, if that is the case and you kind of bear the two and you use the excess nuclear energy coming off of it, that is a positive way of perhaps, you know, creating that hydrogen. That's one possible way. Um, I'm not sure if you're mentioning, if you're going for just using NSMR only to create hydrogen. Oh, it could be any. 
well, I mean, it is a possibility. However, SMRs themselves aren't like the cheapest things ever. So it may not be the best opportunity at the moment. Um, there's a lot of other uh, factors that may go into it. But if it's a byproduct, I, I'm pretty sure that um, depending on where you are in the world, it would have different costs. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the trade-offs is you don't want to truck hydrogen tanks using just conventional fuels from city to city, you know, in areas where there's no hydrogen. So how do you get it locally at airports? Well, if you're going to do it at an airport, I think you might need more than just an SMR. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of hydrogen. Yeah, if you're or, hydrogen. or cities, yeah. I, I think we may have to think about like if if it's a dedicated for an airport, it will probably have a different cost function than just using it as a byproduct, then trucking it or using a pipeline to move that hydrogen somewhere. Um, that might actually be a very interesting study of maybe that the NEA could produce or uh, any of the other organizations that really look into hydrogen production. So that's an interesting thought. I had never thought about an airport just having its own oh, own, yeah, SMR own SMR and to produce site, hydrogen. Yeah, if you have any, for fuel, yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm going to highlight, this is a great way to do innovation right here. Yeah. I had never thought about this. So I'm thinking, I'm just thinking right now, maybe this is something I need to look maybe into. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 13%. I don't know, you know, I'm trying to figure out what, are, what is the cost? What is the percentage of pollution? And, you know, the numbers are all over the place. That's a full industrial case study. Yeah. Yes, I, it I'm, is. I, I'm going to have to think about that one. Thank you. No. I'm fine. I think so. Um, we one more question. We're we're actually we're a little bit over time. I, I know there's lots of um, lots of interest. So if people can stay around, I unfortunately am the time limiting factor here. I have to run to another session. Um, hi, me and Selena here are from Taiwan. I'm Frankie, and um, we're journalists for this the online the, um, media company, and we're wondering how can the media innovate in a way to maybe raise awareness on the pros and cons of nuclear power because I am um, from what I've heard it's mostly about like engineering and physics and that kind of stuff but I'm just wondering how what role will the media side of things play in this whole conversation yeah that's a great question that's a really really good question yeah. I think that's a very great question. We've been discussing about that severally because uh, most of the communications before now have been done by the uh, scientists. And now uh, you know how scientists operate. Breaking down those things to people, uh, it makes uh, things complicated. But now when the media industries come in and uh, they understand what we are doing, I think it will be easier for them to communicate to the, uh, to the masses. I think this is what other industries have been doing. Uh, before now, but uh, lately, I think we've been uh, we are, we've been getting it right because we have uh, some of these um, communication experts who are not truly uh, scientists and they are with us, and then they understand the concept and they understand they explain it to to the masses. I think in in, in simpler manner. Uh, when you look at uh, our uh, in, uh, institutions like the IEA, they have dedicated sections for that where. They employ people who are experts in communication and what have you. So I think the 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 the, the metric is changing. Yeah, um, it's a really great question, and and um, I hope that you go back from here to Taiwan and write an article about net zero nuclear and all the innovative social media. Yeah, and take a look at our website and the social media that's been generated around all of it, and um, and that I think that would be a great article. And um, I'm going to connect you with. My colleague Tim, right there, who's running media for Net Zero Nuclear, and he, he'll send you whatever you need. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Emma. Oh, Emma, Emma has t-shirts. Um, so if you stick around, you can get some t-shirts. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Abba Bakker. Really, really wonderful discussion. And I'm glad that we're going to be spreading uh, lateral thinking and innovate, innovation thinking all around the world. So thank, thank you again. You. Thank you. Thank you.